Oh yeah, yeah. we're in business. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. So, for those viewing at home, this is chapter 35, and so we um, we have this hierarchy: atom, bunch of atoms make molecules, a bunch of molecules make macromolecules, a bunch of macromolecules make organelles, a bunch of organelles make cells. Cell is the smallest unit of life. In other words, none of these things are considered to be living on their own. But that is, that can survive and reproduce, pass on genes over time. That's what life is all about. Cells together make tissues, tissues together make organs, organs together make organ systems. And then you have organisms, if you've got enough organ systems together. Enough organisms together, you have a population. Now we're in the ecology section. Everything here we're talking about is ecology. How populations interact with one another. Um, many, many different populations interacting make a community. If you consider the abiotic living factors of the community and the, I'm sorry, the biotic living factors and the abiotic non-living factors, now you're talking about the ecosystem. So we're not only talking about the ecosystem, we're not only talking about the living things, but we're talking about the amount of water, the temperature, um, the air, you know, soil. Um, what's in what's in the soil, yeah, all the nutrients and such. Now you're talking about the ecosystem. Could location have to do with the ecosystem? Yes. The location human influence. Whether you're next to water or on, on in the desert or uh, yeah, in human influence, yes. Um, that's part of the ecosystem. And then if you consider all the ecosystems on the planet together, you have the biosphere. The biosphere is basically anywhere on the earth where you find life. And it goes all the way from in the clouds in the upper atmosphere. Did you know there's bacteria just floating around in the atmosphere? They found them many, many miles up bacteria floating around up there. All the way down to the bottom of the deepest ocean, there's little worms and stuff crawling around in the mud. Even down in the rocks, inside the earth, there's bacteria that can survive there, too. Bacteria are pretty hardy. And so, so this is a, a hierarchy of organization. This is how our book is arranged. We started learning about atoms and molecules. Do you remember way back then? And we're going to end learning out in the biosphere. So we've we've made our way through this. So we're never going to have to talk about any of those other things again. Well, you have an AP exam at the end where they test you on all of it. Goodness, I forgot about that. So I can't really say that. No. Um. So, so every time you go up an organization, you can have new properties that arise. We call these emergent properties. For instance, a single cell cannot digest a steak. But the digestive system can digest a steak. <laughs> a single organism cannot build a bridge. What did he say? But many people can build a bridge working together. So every every step up that we make in the the organization, we have properties that come about, things that can that can happen because of the organization. You know, organelles can't reproduce on their own, but cells can. So reproduction is an emergent property that comes about through organization. Organization is, a, is an important factor. So we will study, this is what the next three chapters are on. A chapter on this, a chapter on that, a chapter on that.
there's an organism. There's a population, a whole bunch of these. What is that, an ibex? Is that what you call that? Yeah. A whole bunch of ibexes, ibises, I don't even know. What's the term of ibexes? Here's the community, so you not only have those, you have the zebras, and you have whatever those are, and the birds, and the trees, and the grasses, all interacting amongst one another. And you gotta include the bacteria and the fungi, fungi and all the protists and stuff to make up a community. And then if you consider the, the water and the sunlight and um, the soil and the temperature and all those factors, then you have the ecosystem. And finally you have the biosphere, all the ecosystems connected. Isn't that fun? That's really cool. I like it. This is, uh, the book talks about some of the close interactions in nature. This is the Carner Blue Butterfly. And it lays its eggs only on wild lupine. This is a wild lupine. And so, it won't lay its eggs on anything else. And so, if the wild lupine goes extinct, <coughs> So will the Carner Blue Butterfly. Oh, no. Most if the wild lupine becomes much more prevalent for some reason, so will the Carner Blue Butterfly. So species are closely um, dependent upon one another. Okay, here's a word you need to know, conspecifics. Um, conspecifics, organisms that are all members of the same species. All of these are tigers. Species Panthera tigris. These are all the same species, which from the biological definitions means they can mate with one another and still produce fertile offspring. If they can mate with one another and still produce fertile offspring, they're considered all the same species. But there are differences in them. You can especially see a difference between this one and the others. And so when there are differences and there are populations, like there's a population of ones that look like this somewhere and go to a different place, you'll have, they'll all look like, kind of like this. So we call these subspecies. Have you ever heard of subspecies? Yeah. So they're all the same species, but there's different subspecies, which means evolutionarily they're starting to branch off on an evolutionary tree. But they're still, they're not different species yet. Maybe if time passed and they remained separated from one another, maybe they would eventually become separate species. Now, heterospecific means they're different species. These are all birds, but they're different species of birds, meaning they don't mate with one another. So they're heterospecific. Hetero means different, and con means with, or the same. With species, you're with your species, or you're different species. Aren't those good words? This landscape ecologist is releasing a black-footed ferret into its native habitat. Oh, uh -huh. it must have been in the box. Do you want to be a landscape ecologist when you grow up? Yes. Of course. Okay, so what is endemic versus generalist? If we say that an organism is endemic, that means um, it lives in a certain area. So uh, the wallaby and the echidna are endemic. If we say they're endemic to Australia, that's where they're found. Does that mean they can only live there? That means that's where, yeah, that's where they... Now, maybe they could live in another place if we brought them there, but, but that's where they're found. They're found in Australia. They're endemic to Australia. That's where they are living. 
doesn't mean they have to be there, but that's where they are. Anyone here been to Australia? <laughs> that would be a serious conspiracy. Um, so, if we say that uh, an organism is a generalist, that means it can be found all over the place. It's not really specific to a certain region. Something like a rat. Uh, the rat species are usually generalists. They, they got everywhere. Yeah, different bacteria. They managed to find their way around the whole planet, pretty much. Um, they don't require a certain location. Um, and they're generally found in a lot of places. So that's why we say generalist. It's very general. They're not specific to a certain area. The book uh, goes into the biogeography, and um, biogeography is basically the idea that different parts of the planet have different amounts of organisms and species, and different temperatures and different amounts of water and different amounts of rainfall. The two largest things affecting organisms are temperature and rainfall, or precipitation. The amount of water there is in the, in the temperature will greatly affect where the, the organisms that live there. And so, if you look at, if you count the number of species of something, I don't know if this is mammal species. Hmm. I'm not sure. Let's say it's mammal species. In the purple places, there's only one mammal species. So up here, maybe it's polar bears. Up here, only one species of mammal. And also down here, near the South Pole, there's just not many. But as you move toward the equator, you get many more species. And this is probably not mammals. Plants, I'm pretty sure. What is it? I'm pretty sure it's plants. Plants. Uh, it's probably not plants. This is something more specific, like, like maybe it's bear species, for instance. Lizards. It could be, could be. Or trees. It's probably not lizards. I don't know if you find lizards up here. It's too cold. I need to look. I need to look up. It's something pretty specific. But anyway, here in the middle, pine tree. It's pine tree. No, there's not pine trees. Oh well, I guess there's. Y'all aren't looking this up, are you? Y'all are just shouting things out. I thought, thought some of y'all. I think it's dinosaurs. <laughs> um. Fish. But here in the middle of the country is the highest distribution of species, 61 to 144 of some species, some kind of organism. There are lots of species here. What's so special about right here? It's the equator. Yeah, that's the equator. That's where it's hottest and the most rainfall. That's where your rainforests are. So you're going to have a lot of species there. Heading here. 
This is a flower, the forest gardenia, uh, the flower of the forest gardenia is an endangered species. And this is the spotted owl. Have you ever heard of the spotted owl? The northern spotted owl saved the old growth forests in, in the northeast, northwestern U.S. So they were going to cut down the last of the old growth forests in, say, Oregon and um, Northern California. And the environmentalists found that this species of owl is found in no other place. And if you cut down these forests, it would go extinct. And there was a law that said if you know that cutting down a habitat will drive an organism to extinction, you can't do it. And so back in the 70s, like when I was y'all's age, 70s and maybe the early 80s, the environmentalists took the, the people who were cutting down the trees to, to court and won a big legal battle saving the forest and this owl from extinction. Um, it was kind of a big deal back then. Wait, this is... What's that? This is this is when the Stanford ban um got um they didn't make like a chainsaw or something. Making fun of the whole deal and they got in big trouble. I never heard that. So there are species that are endemic to certain areas that um are, it's that's their last area where they live and if you're not careful you can eliminate species species are going extinct right now at just almost just as fast a rate as during the great mass extinctions in the history of the planet um, a lot of biologists would say that this is a mass we're in a mass extinction right now because of human activity we've cut down basically half, over half the trees on the planet humans have. If you go back 100,000 years before humans, there would have been twice as many forests. And, you know, we cut them down for different reasons. you got to build houses, you got to build cities, roads. Um, and that reduces the habitat, and you just don't have as many organisms as you used to. And so, I don't know if you remember, but... In the, in the extinction event that killed the dinosaurs, something like 75% of all life disappeared from the planet. Well, just by our activity so far, we've got about half of it gone. That's a pretty big extinction. Um, and you don't really even notice it's going on. It happens kind of gradually. Kind of scary. Um, so, the, the book goes through different factors that affect organisms. Sunlight is a, is a big factor. And um, this is a flower that flowers in the spring. Um, it does it while the leaves are off the tree, off the trees. And then in the summer, of course, late in the spring, trees that lose their leaves will grow new leaves. And so there's a lot of sunlight on the floor of the forest um, in the spring before the, the leaves regrow. And so there are plants that make their living down there on the forest floor only in those times where they can get good sunlight, produce flowers, mate, and then all of a sudden it gets shady. And they won't get sun again until the next year. Yes? It was the map illustrated a number of amphibians. Amphibians! Who said lizards? Lizards are close. Let's go. So there's some amphibian species in northern Alaska. There's, I was thinking there might be like salamanders and stuff. Yeah, you can Salamanders are amphibians. It's not going to be where it's dry. Let's do it. Of course they are. Hey, y'all are welcome. Good job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about uh, nutrients? 
from the ocean. There's a process called upwelling you need to know about, where ocean currents, ocean currents don't only move water along the surface, they move water underneath too. They circulate vertically. And so there are ocean currents that come move along the bottom and push nutrients up. And then organisms at the surface will use those nutrients as kind of like fertilizer to grow and, and reproduce. And uh, you have big algae blooms on the edges of continents. So this is would be the, the continental crust here. And the ocean is down here, and it hits the continent, and it gets pushed upward and brings a bunch of nutrients that are on the ocean floor with it. The west coast of South America is a location where there's a huge amount of nutrients that come up, and it causes the plankton in the water here to multiply like crazy. So if you're interested in that thing, you can take marine biology and talk about it. So are they like a glow-in-the-dark, like algae and stuff? Yeah, a lot of those things do glow in the dark. Dinoflagellates. Yeah. What's that? A dead zone is an area where there's com you can get too many nutrients in an area and then get too much plankton growth. And then um, the, the huge, uh, the huge um, um, algae bloom is what it's called, uses up all the oxygen from the, from the water, and that's what's called a dead zone. That usually happens in areas where rivers are spilling into the ocean and bringing a bunch of fertilizer from farms and such. And uh, so you get it like at the mouth of the Mississippi, there's one location where there's a giant dead zone. It's just an area of the ocean where there's not much oxygen. We talk about those in a later chapter. But a lot of organisms rely on these algae blooms, plankton blooms, um, because fish eat the plankton, and so you don't get much fish without this upwelling of nutrients. The wind here coming off the coast drives this current, because the wind pushes the water this way, and of course if the water is moving this way, more water has to replace it, and that pulls the water up from the bottom. This is showing how lakes will turn over. Um, in the winter, a lot of lakes will freeze at the top. And um, we don't really get it cold enough around here where our lakes freeze. But imagine up in you know, Michigan, areas like that, you'll get frozen, frozen lakes. And the water's not really moving around much. But when when that melts, and um, the, the, so we're going winter, spring, summer, fall. So um, do y'all know that heat rises? Y'all ever heard that? So four degrees is the most dense that uh, water gets. If water is zero degrees, it's ice, and ice floats. Um, but then, if you move away from zero degrees, the water gets more dense at four degrees. It's weird if you if you were to graph the density of water. Um, four degrees is the most dense. So. We had a graph, and oh, we got a temperature down here, density here. So zero degrees, two, two four, six, eight, ten degrees. Um, this is Celsius. Water has a curve that where it's not very dense here at zero, it's most dense at four. And then it goes back down as you get hotter. So four is the highest density. 
And that means water at 4 degrees will sink to the bottom. You ever put ice into like really hot water? Would the ice sink before, like, could I? Is there a point where the Could the ice is? sink before it melts? Right. Maybe. It's a good question. I'll find out. Sounds like a science fair experiment. It does. Um, I don't know how hot the water has to be where its density gets over ice. It's a good question. But anyway, um, the the as the water heats up, the um, the densest water will be on the bottom in the winter. But um, as the surface uh, heats up, um, you have a uh, you have what's called a turnover. So here, the, it's ice is on top. It's zero degrees. The ice is floating. That's the, the least dense the water gets. And you have floating ice. And it keeps the rest of the lake from freezing. And now um, what happens is, as the, as the ice melts and it starts to heat up, this top layer gets, gets less dense as it warms up. It's the weirdest thing, but as it gets to 4 degrees, then it'll fall down again. And it'll mix the entire lake up. And nutrients will get pushed up from the bottom as this water gets more dense and falls to the bottom. And that's called the spring turnover. So you're turning over all the water in there as this, as this ice melts and then gets more dense as it gets warmer. Falls down. And the same thing will happen again the next year. So here's in the summer. The top of the lake is hot. The bottom of the lake is cold. Have you ever dove in a lake? And like you go down deep, it's real cold down there. You ever notice that? We used to dive for golf balls when I was a kid in the lakes. And the bottom would be real cold. And the top would feel nice and warm. But then as the temperature changes again, the uh, as it gets colder on the top, it gets more and more dense, and it will fall down and you'll have another turnover. And that raise, every time you have a turnover, it raises nutrients from the bottom and feeds the plankton at the top. And when I say nutrients, I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, elements that are used to help them make food and grow, to help them uh, uh, do photosynthesis and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's not the it's not the calories itself. Um, it's not we're not talking about glucose. We're talking about um, various uh, elements. Usually, for fertilizer, it's nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium. Those are the three things that are really important when you fertilize plants and when you help algae grow. They need those. You know why you need nitrogen, right? What organic molecules use nitrogen? DNA. DNA, the nitrogen basis, remember that? And proteins, the little amino groups. And each amino acid has a nitrogen in it. So you need nitrogen to make these molecules in the first place. You ever seen a bag of fertilizer? It'll say something like 20, 10, 20. Are there any farmers out there? That's the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium by weight in the fertilizer bag. And a farmer will know, they can just tell by looking, oh, I'm, we're, we're low on nitrogen. It's the way the plant looks. After you farm for a while, you figure this stuff out. So you could, you could buy a bag that's just uh, like 40 zero, 0 It's just got a bunch of nitrogen in, in the bag. Different fertilizers for different problems. This is good stuff. You also be farmers when you grow up. Farmers make a lot of money. Um, I guess it depends on how much land you have. No, I don't make a whole lot. If you don't have much land and you're a farmer, you won't make much money. You have to have like at least 3,000 acres to make any sort of profit. 3,000 acres? Unless you're like a dairy farmer. My family was a bunch of farmers from um, Thomasville, Georgia. Do you know where that is? Mine are right next to you in Durham, Georgia. 
So my great my great granddad had nine boys. Eight of them chose to be farmers and took the land. One of them chose to go to college and become a doctor. That was my granddad. The one that didn't take the land. So all of my family on my dad's side are all farmers. A huge, it's a huge tracts of land. They grow peanuts. And I remember as a kid pulling up, I mean, we, they made boiled peanuts all the time. My, my aunt said, go, you know, go out and pull some peanuts. So you pull the vine off and there'd be all these peanuts hanging off of it. And I'd pick them, you know, and I'd get this big bowl of peanuts and I'd come in with it. And I had this huge bowl of peanuts and I'd just run like one string. And I remember looking up and seeing as far as I could see in all directions, peanuts. And I had filled a whole bowl. It took me like 30 minutes picking peanuts, just off one little string. And there was this giant. I was like, oh my gosh, so many peanuts. <laughs> I was like, you can, have, you can sell these? Yeah. Have you ever heard of peanut patch? Unless you're allergic. There are peanuts that come in a little can. Yeah. Boiled peanuts. You can buy them in the grocery store. That's my family's peanuts. Have you ever heard of hardy? Oh, wait, have you heard of hardy peanuts? What's that? Hardy bull peanuts. I used to go to school with their kid. They have like 40,000 acres in Middle Georgia. I don't know how many acres that family has. They sell to like China and Japan and stuff. Anyway, enough about my family. Um, I'm going to talk about my family. How do you survive changes in temperature? These organisms can do it. Most enzymes only function between 0 and 45 Celsius. If you get below 0, then the water in the cell is frozen. And that doesn't work. And if you get above 45, what happens to the enzyme? It denatures. It comes apart. It doesn't hold its 3D shape. It comes apart like this. and goes back to its primary structure. And so it doesn't work anymore. So, have you ever wondered why a tree in the winter, trees don't regulate their temperature? So how does a tree survive the winter if it's negative 40 outside? What keeps the tree from freezing? You ever wondered about that? So. It's got a trick. It's got a trick. The cells, here's a cell inside a tree. The cells will pump water out. Water gets pumped out. And when you get rid of waters, your amount of sugar goes way up that's inside. So they keep sugars in and they pump water out. And they get real high molarities. You might go up to 0.8 molar um, molarity sugar inside your cell. And that freezes. That doesn't freeze easily. The more sugar or salt you have in something, the harder it is to freeze. Did y'all know that? So you get maple syrup from... So that's how the cells survive. They pump out all the water, they get high amounts of sugar inside their cell, and that won't freeze. The water that they pump out around them will freeze, but that doesn't kill a cell because it's outside of the cell. And the cell remains alive in there, still with water inside of it, still able to, to survive the winter. And it waits until it gets warm again, and then it'll absorb the water back. Isn't that a great trick? What do animals do? Well, a lot of them migrate, which means let's move out of the cold area and go to a warmer area. You ever heard birds fly south for the winter? Yeah. Why do they do it? Um, they can hibernate, which is what a bear chooses to do. It gets its, it eats, it eats all summer and fall, and gets plenty of fat, and then it kind of goes to sleep for the whole winter, and it slows its metabolism down, and it'll burn that fat, keeping itself a little warm, not not as warm as usual, but a little bit warm so it doesn't freeze, 
and it'll burn off all that fat. And when it wakes up in the, the next spring, it's skinny again. Wouldn't that be a good way to go on a diet if you could do that? Just go to sleep for three months and wake up skinny? Yeah. And then eat all you want for another year? So if it doesn't eat enough before hibernating, it'll die. Does it just die? Does it, does it wake up early? Does it end hibernation early? Or That's a good question. When does it know to go get food again? It's just hungry. Yeah. They get real hungry. Um, so somehow their body will wake them up and get them out of hibernation. This frog has antifreeze in its blood. What it is. The same kind of antifreeze you put in a car. And it keeps its blood from freezing so it can actually survive in the ice. And its whole body will get really cold, but the antifreeze will keep the blood in the cells from freezing. And they're just a frozen frog. If you took them out, they would be a popsicle frog. But, but inside, those cells are still alive because of the antifreeze. They don't move when they're that cold. The monkeys do. They can survive. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll continue uh, later. So just just read, and uh, we'll do more tomorrow. I'm a little off, I think, but we'll figure it out.